So, I have quite a bit of stories to share with you. First, let me introduce myself. You can call me Bill. I used to work in the Ranger Services in North Carolina back in the early to mid-2000s. This was one of the very first search and rescue cases I'd ever been on. We were looking for a missing hiker. We ended up having to go deep into the beginning of the Pisgah National Forest in this section. It's really dark. There's a lot of woods and a lot of foliage, especially at night when it is so dark and covered. Even moonlight has a hard time breaking through, but it wasn't like anything had actually happened yet. We were pretty sure that this was just simply a case of a hiker who had gotten turned around and put in circles. We found him luckily alive, and he claimed that there were others out there with him, and that he was not by himself. We asked him if he had been hiking with anybody else who'd also gone missing. That's not what he meant, that there were other things out there in the night. The other search and rescue guy with us claimed that he saw this large ape, like creatures stalking us. Apparently, it had long hair and a long whip lizard-like tail. The guy was fine, but still very, very creepy. Another story I have to share with you is from a good friend. His grandmother's from England, and one of my earliest memories of her is telling me about seeing Bigfoot. She was in the Scottish Highlands with her family back around the 1920s, and they were on their way to a local small town when she sees this creature. She said it was tall and covered in dark hair, also walked up like a wild, hairy man. She thought it was some farmer playing a trick, but soon realized by the speed and power in which it moved, this was a real-life thing. Back then, they had no concept of a Bigfoot, but they knew they were real creatures, something that really lived. Although she kept referring to it as a wild, hairy man and not a Bigfoot, I guess this Bigfoot creature chased after her before nearly trying to kill the horse. Another story is told to me by another ranger who worked in the Smoky Mountains. He'd been assigned to one of the ranger stations way back behind the Cataloochee. He said it was a very slow night. He'd been in the station for about an hour, and he hears this deep, weird kind of coughing noise right outside, like something really big was trying to clear its throat of phlegm. He peeks out the window and sees what looked like a large Bigfoot, but standing up on its hind legs, looking right at him. My buddy didn't stick around long enough to see if it would come inside. That's one of the times where you wish you had your gun with you and ready to go. All right, the final story I'll share is by far the most disturbing. I still get chills thinking about it. This happened to me while we were doing a search for some lost hikers. This was in West Virginia's north region. We had helicopter support on this one. We were having trouble finding any sign of them at all. They'd been out there less than 24 hours. Things weren't looking that great. We had a few trackers with us, and they were always able to pick up on little bits of information that the rest of us had missed. One of us was going over the helicopter's footage when he said he saw something in the trees. We made our way over there to where he was pointing, and sure enough, this large, snouted creature began picking its way through the underbrush. He said it looked at the chopper once before disappearing back into the woods, trying to stay out of the light. This thing started screaming this strange guttural language at us and then kind of just vanished. That's easily the one S.A.R. case I'll probably never forget. So this was about two years ago in my garden at about 3 a.m. I just got a puppy and he'd wake me up to go outside at silly hours of the morning. Anyway, I heard a couple days before from one of the neighbors that someone was standing on her shed roof just laughing at her and her family while they were watching TV. They called the police, but he was gone as soon as he heard the sirens. Apparently, someone else around the corner reported the same thing a week before, but he apparently had some sort of shiv, but the police didn't find him. Back to my part in this. So my lovely little pupper was running around the garden, and I was just standing there looking around, and I saw him standing on someone else's shed. I grabbed my pup and ran in the house. I think I threw an orange at him to try and scare him off, but he didn't even budge. 
I was about to call the police when I heard a screech and saw loads of police running down the alleyway by my house. I turned to look at the guy, but he was gone. The police called for a helicopter and everything. He was never found, but stopped doing it. I personally suspect it as being the Croydon. London, United Kingdom. Cat killer is both people and cats, but who knows? Generally feeling shaken up, remembering it all as I'm writing this. My friend once showed up in a panic at my old house where I lived with my now ex. She was really worried, asking if we were all right and what happened. We couldn't figure out what she meant. We'd just been at home that day. She showed us her phone. On her calls were three missed calls and a voicemail from my phone number an hour before. The voicemail was mostly garbled, shouting and crying, but it definitely sounded like my voice. Then my ex telling me to calm down. Then me crying again. My phone had no record of the calls or the voicemail. We hadn't argued or yelled. I hadn't cried. We still don't know what happened, but it was weird as heck. I took a solo backpacking trip to Japan in 2018. During the first week of the trip, a group of travelers and myself decided to go and drink at one of the local karaoke bars. After approximately two hours of constant drinking and singing, we all left the place fairly drunk. We were all on the street when myself and a girl from the group decided that we needed to go to the toilet. We left the group that was congregating on the sidewalk and entered a building a block or two away. We caught an elevator up a few floors and exited as we were walking down these red felt corridors. We approached the entry of what seemed to be an old school Japanese gentleman's club. The tipsy Danish girl whom I was with walked straight on into the place and I instantly got tingles in the back of my neck. Every single Japanese man there was looking at her as she strolled on up to the bar. I felt something was off and grabbed her wrist and swiftly pulled her out. We jogged out of that place and came to a set of fire stairs. We started to briskly walk down them while talking about that weird encounter. This is where it gets done. During our rush downstairs, we went one floor lower than we should have and ended up in the basement. As I rounded the corner, I saw a man dressed in a SWAT uniform couching with his gun drawn, his back to us. In the room, I could count about three, four dead Japanese men riddled with bullet holes leaning up against pillars and on the floor. I grabbed my Danish friend and noped the F out of that place. Still to this day, I don't know what the F I saw. Was it a snuff? Was it role play? I don't know. I was very drunk, but I also know what I saw. Around when I was in middle school, I went to a friend's house to hang out, and their mother pulled out a UEJ board. This particular one was marketed towards speaking with angels for us to use for fun. There were about five or six of us using it and asking it various questions, and when it was my turn, I chose to see if I could speak with my father, who had passed some years prior. I decided to ask questions that no one else in the room could possibly know, and the board gave the correct answer every time. I'm not religious in the slightest and have a more than healthy level of skepticism, and the same could be said when I was that age as well. So I decided to remove my hand from the board because I knew it was possible that I could be subconsciously moving it to the right place. I keep asking it a couple more questions, and it keeps giving the correct answer. So I'm pretty freaked out at this point and choose to try to rationalize what happened in my head. The next kid starts asking questions about one of his dead relatives, and it tells him a detail about their death that he didn't know, but sounded pretty plausible. At least he seemed to think so, as he locked himself into a bedroom after that in hysterics. I don't know what happened in that house to this day, but it was the closest I've ever come to what I would call a supernatural experience. Me and my friends used to go camp and hike out in northern Arizona. 
It was usually a big group of ten, twelve of us, and one of our favorite things to do was play tag after dark. The first day we got there, it was already getting dark out, so we would have to wait until tomorrow to do some hiking. We quickly set up camp and, once dark, decided to play hide and seek. We would pair off in couples to be safe while the two hunters used walkie-talkies to communicate and find us. I preferred staying close to camp hidden because nine times out of ten, the hunters will take off for the woods first thing. Me and my partner were well hidden on top of a hill surrounded by some rocks and dead trees. The hill was perfect because it gave a perfect view of the campground and no one could sneak up on us. Well, while we were waiting, we saw someone return to camp. Instantly, we knew this wasn't one of our friends. The figure was closer to seven foot tall but looked skin and bone frail. The man either had a twitch or was on drugs because he kept shaking his head violently. He had something shiny and metal in his hand. It wasn't until he passed a lantern we hung up early, I saw he was carrying a hatchet. At that point, we were both freaked out. We still had cell service, so I got on our group chat and quickly posted someone is at our camp, return ASAP. This is out of game. Knowing they would be coming shortly, me and my friend decided to charge at the guy from our hiding place, hoping to scare him into leaving. The moment we stepped out of hiding, the man turned towards our direction, as if he knew we were there the whole time. We ran at the guy, but he didn't budge or even move. We stopped about twenty feet away, waiting for some kind of a reaction from him. But there wasn't one. He stood there with his face blank, watching and studying us right back. My friend yelled at the man, asking him what was he doing, what did he want, and so on. The man started to smile randomly as my friend continued yelling at him. There was something chilling about the way he smiled at us, like he was posing for a picture showing the biggest grin humanly possible. Suddenly five of our friends came charging for the camp right at the guy. All of us played sports or were in some kind of lifting, so we were all in good shape. But like before, it was like the man knew they were there and the moment they gave chase, he took off. He was faster than any of us, which shouldn't have been possible just by looking at his physical shape. We lost him almost immediately. Just like that, it was over, and we returned to camp. By the time we got back, the rest of the group had made it. We told them about what happened and debated if we should leave or stay. Seeing there was twelve of us, we figured we would take turns keeping watch. It was just one guy, so what could he possibly do, all of us? We started to unwind and hang out smoking by the fire until we decided to pass out. We woke up from our friend, a Jay, yelling outside the tents. It was still dark out and he was keeping watch, but something had freaked him out. He said he kept hearing something big moving around the camp just out of his line of sight. We went over to where he heard the noise but found nothing. Once we were sure it was safe, we went back to our tents. Just as we all started to get back in the same man from before leaped out of one of our tents. We stood there in shock and terror for a moment to long, because before any of us could react, the man was running away again. This time he was laughing as he ran. Just his laugh alone sounded hysterical and not deranged. After that, we quickly packed all our gear and got the hell out of there. The incident made sure we never returned to the same area for camping. We would still go hiking around there, but as far as camping went, we wouldn't dare. Not again. Not my story, but my seniors. Two of them were sending one of my friends that has fallen sick. We all are in the same club, and we're having a camp. From a park back to the bunk late at night. Before the camp begins, all of the seniors wore wristbands that were taken from a temple to protect them from any danger, because we never knew what would happen. As they were walking back, they were lost. However, out of nowhere, a black dog appeared and started walking in front of them, like it was a sign asking them to follow. They followed, and they did actually went back to the bunk safely. When they looked for the dog after that, the dog disappeared. They even mentioned that the dog was pure black, just like a shadow. When my senior looked at his wrist, the wristband was gone. Creepy, if you ask me.
I was out on a routine job patrolling a remote area of the park when I saw it, the small but unmistakable opening of a cave. Since it wasn't on any of the maps, and it was my job to check things like that out, I wasted no time in taking out my flashlight and heading towards the smaller but manageable cave, opening that was wide enough for me to step through without having to crouch down. The cave was situated in a clearing close to a pond. The opening was located right in the middle of a wall of sandstone and was fairly unremarkable looking. No sign that it was dangerous or out of the ordinary. Since the opening was barely wide enough for several people to step through, that meant the cave had never been turned into a mine. There was also no garbage lying around or any other traces of recent human activity. So for all I knew, I was the first human being to set foot in this cave in who knows how long. The feeling came with a sense of exhilaration I'd never felt before. So I took a deep breath, switched on my extra strength flashlight, and steadily started walking inside. My first few steps in the cave were beyond cautious. Aside from the fact I'd never been here before, the terrain was very steep. You could feel it slowly descending further into the earth. Since I didn't want to lose my footing and go tumbling down, I kept casting the flashlight beam around, because despite the intense glaring light it provided, the darkness in the cave was unlike anything I had ever seen before. I'd been in the forest at night many times, but this far exceeded that. This darkness was dense. After enough careful steps, the descent became smoother and the floor leveled out. The cave floor itself was rough in some spots and smooth in others. You could tell where the elements had weathered away parts of the land and made a smoother path to walk. The temperature had also dropped significantly down here, and I could now see the many impressive stalactites and stalagmites dotting the cave. The rough descent had been replaced by a fairly even path straight forward, but there wasn't a ton of space to walk around here. A small group of people could squeeze through, but no more than that. My boots occasionally crunched on gravel, but uh, apart from that, the cave floor was empty, almost uncannily clean. Seeing how untouched the cave was, it can't help but make you feel like an insignificant speck in the vast scheme of the universe. The cave was not only far older than I was, it would be here long after I was gone. Especially because the cave seemed endless. The more I explored the more I got the sense that I was making no progress at all. A look at my watch told me I'd been down there for about an hour when the narrow path opened into a massive chamber, and the sight made me gasp. The entire space was filled with water, and the walkway served as a makeshift bridge to the other side. The walls were rough-hewn and jagged virtually everywhere you looked. There. It'd been plenty of impressive stalactites in the cave, but the ones dangling from the ceiling here were massive. So precise and sharp-looking, it seemed impossible that they had occurred naturally. Some of them were practically touching the water that filled the space. I had no idea how deep the water was, but in the thick darkness, it looked unnervingly deep. The walkway that went from one side of the cavern to the other got rougher here, but it still looked as steady and weathered as before. So, being more careful of where I stepped than ever, I slowly began to cross the cavern. I was almost halfway across when I heard the sound of a rock hit a cavern wall and splash into the water. The sound in the empty space seemed so uncannily loud I almost jumped. Once I was sure of my footing, I carefully shined the flashlight around to check. There was nothing. No signs that anything at all had happened. But on this job, you learn that just because everything looks fine doesn't mean nothing is going on. The hair standing up on the back of my neck told me everything I needed to know. I didn't dare take another step forward. If anything, I was slowly adjusting my footing to turn back around. I was just about to go back the way I came when I heard it, the sound of whispered voices. At first, I had no idea what it was. I hadn't heard a single sound before now, aside from my own footstep. Ignoring the chill slowly washing over me, I slowly began to walk back across the cavern. I'm not sure if it was just my imagination, but as I did, the whispering got louder. 
The creepiest part was how the voice seemed faintly familiar. Not enough so I recognized it, but enough that it was unsettling. The worst part was that I had absolutely no idea where the voice was coming from. The acoustics of the cave made it seem like the voice was both everywhere and nowhere at the same time. I was almost completely across the cavern when I cast my flashlight around and saw it. There, on the left side of the cavern, in the middle of the dark water, was a shadow, with my heart pounding in my chest and the grip on my flashlight slick from sweat. I carefully turned and aimed the beam directly at it. The water illuminated was a murky gray, but the shape was as dark as it had been without the flashlight. I had no idea what the shape was. It was completely solid, but it wasn't any sort of animal, and it didn't look remotely human. It just hung there, floating just below the surface. If there had been the slightest suggestion of human activity here, I'd say it was garbage, a blanket, or some clothing that fell in the water. But I knew that wasn't the case. The sight made my stomach clench. But then, with my flashlight still aimed right at it, it disappeared. There was no movement or any disturbance in the water. It just vanished. That was my cue to leave. Once I was safely across the cavern and on solid ground, I ran out of there as fast as I could due to the numerous rock formations I had to maneuver around. It seemed to take an eternity. I periodically checked behind me to make sure there was nothing there, and while there never was, I could never shake the feeling that something was watching me. After what seemed like a painfully long time, I finally arrived back at the cave opening. Then came the difficult task of maneuvering what was essentially an uphill climb. By now, I was drenched in sweat, and the climb did nothing to help that. But taking care with where and when I stepped, I eventually was standing at the mouth of the cave with daylight coming through. I gratefully walked out into the sunshine and looked down into the cave. As I did, I swear I saw a figure walk past on the cave floor below. But when I looked back, it was gone. Once I caught my breath, I radioed the cave discovery into the station, and some other rangers came out to check it out. One of them was my boss, Jack. I told them I didn't see anything. But one look at me and my demeanor told them something was up. Jack was no stranger to the unusual things park rangers can and do encounter on the job. So with him and the other two rangers listening, I told them what I saw and experienced down in the cave. When I was done, Jack sat there quietly for a moment. Doesn't matter if it's 2022 or 1822, things still go bump in the night, he said in his deep, steady voice. I don't disagree, I muttered. I'm sure you don't, Wade. I won't pretend I saw what you saw, but I believe you saw what you saw. Nature can be, and often is, a very scary place. No kidding. One of the other rangers agreed. There's a reason this cave looked so untouched by people. No sign of animals either. None. Jack shook his head at that. That's a sign something is off. Animals don't go near something. That means people shouldn't either, so we'll mark this cave as dangerous. Go back to base and log the find. Now let's get out of here. I was checking on the animals when the weather radio blared up the tornado warning. I wasn't too surprised there was a large storm over the area, southeast Oklahoma, and there was already an advisory in effect. I closed up the barn door and hurried towards the house, meeting with my kids and my husband. Halfway, there are tornado shelters in an old dugout house on the side of a hill from when my family first moved to the area. Tornadoes don't occur often in our area. We got ourselves into the shelter and we barred the metal door. The dugout has had a few upgrades over the past century, but the metal door was there from the beginning. My great-grandparents lived in the dugout for five years until they met the Homestead Act requirements. My great-grandpa didn't mind the dugout, but my great-great... Grandma was a whole different story. My husband keeps the dugout prepared for anything. His dad was a kid living in Woodward, Oklahoma, when the Woodward tornado came through. His family survived the destruction, but they became preachers of preparedness after that. 
He made sure that the dugout was stocked with a week's worth of canned food, water, a radio, flashlights, and batteries. We never had to use more than the radio and the flashlight in all these years of occasional tornado warnings, until this particular tornado that is. About five minutes after we settled into the dugout, the wind started picking up outside. We could hear thunder and rain outside the doors. We started hearing the impacts of large hail hitting the metal dugout door. The sound of the wind changed to a roar, similar to a plane about to take off. We could hear the different sounds of objects hitting the door, but then we heard a loud crack and a lot of scraping on the door. In total, the entire event lasted maybe seven minutes, but we didn't try to leave the dugout until the wind died down. My husband unbarred the door and tried opening it, but it would only open about an inch. We could see through the crack that the apple tree next to the dugout had blown over in front of the door. We tried to pry the door open every which way, slamming our bodies against the door, but nothing worked. We were stuck in the shelter. We knew at some point there would be people checking on places in the tornado's path, so we stuck a piece of wood in the crack of the door to hold it open and got comfortable, prepared to wait. My husband never thought about latrine logistics, for if you were trapped in a shelter. When 7 p.m. rolled around, we discovered that claustrophobia and panic attacks can strike anyone, no matter how prepared you are. We were safe and were prepared physically for a week, but I'm not sure our minds could have lasted a week. We could see it was dark through the crack of the door when a foul odor wafted in. It smelled like a wet dog combined with a male goat in a teenager's armpits. I thought it was an overly pungent skunk, and I went to shut the door, but I stopped when I heard what sounded like footsteps. We started yelling for help, calling out to whoever was out there, but nobody responded. There was a shuffling sound, and the smell got even stronger. My eyes were watering as I yelled out and pounded on the door. I heard a grunt before the sound of footsteps, and the odor started fading away. The kids asked why the person didn't help us. I didn't know, but I told them that maybe they were going for extra help. It didn't explain why the person didn't at least talk to us. The footsteps returned. We yelled and pounded on the door, and again no response. The footsteps and odor faded away again. This time I felt uneasy and I barred the door shut. Two times this person came and ignored our calls for help. Something wasn't right with this person. The kids and my husband fell asleep and I kept an ear out for rescuers for a few hours. Around three in the morning my daughter woke up from a nightmare and started crying. I was comforting her when I heard branches cracking and scraping against the door along with grunting. I woke my husband up and we pounded on the door and yelled. We could smell that odor again, so we left the door bar just in case. When the noises outside stopped, we waited about ten minutes to try to open the door. This time, the door opened enough for us to step out. The trunk of the tree was still laying near the door, but there was a pile of branches off to the side. There were a lot of footprints, but they were bigger than any foot. I had ever seen. We woke our son up, and we all left the dugout and headed towards the house. It was still dark, but we could see that for the most part the tornado didn't do much damage. We checked the house. I headed up to the barn to see if the animals were okay. I was about halfway there when I heard one of our hogs screaming. I ran towards the barn and stopped a few yards away. I could see my market. Ready Hampshire Barrel struggling and screaming while slung over the shoulder of a dark, hulking, human-like figure. I yelled at the figure to drop my pig, and it just turned and looked at me. I shined my flashlight at the creature's face. It had a grayish face with a flat-looking nose. It had thin, dark brown hair all over its body and massive feet. After a few seconds, it turned and walked into our cornfield towards the creek and disappeared from my view. I've seen finding Bigfoot, so I know what I was looking at. I know it was a Bigfoot. I talked to my mom, and she said she had seen the wild people when she was a kid. My great-great-grandpa had installed the metal door on the dugout, 
after hearing stories of wild people in the area, but the only trouble they seemed to cause was stealing livestock like what I had seen. We've had animals seemingly disappear in thin air over the years, and it makes sense now. By that point, I didn't mind the loss of the pig. The wild people had rescued my family from the dugout. When I was in high school, Tempe, Arizona, a group of us were wandering a golf course at night. We were sophomores, completely sober. One of the girls with us started crying, saying she saw something jump out of a palm tree. We teased her, carried on. Until moments later, I looked up and hand to God on my mother's life. I see this wolf-like creature on all fours lurking towards us. It was darker than the surrounding night, and all I could make out was the German shepherd-looking head, snout outline, long pointed ears. No eye shine. Its arms were cocked forward and longer than the rest of its body. It had to have been at least five feet tall slumped over. I can't imagine how tall it was if it had stood up. I yelled and we all ran, but it didn't chase us. Has anyone else experienced this in a heavy populated city? For years I couldn't wrap my head around what we saw. Only three out of the six people witnessed this DM, finally came across Dogman Encounters Radio with Vic and have been obsessed ever since. I apologize for the lack of punctuation. I'm just trying to get it out and using voice text. I've had several encounters before, a lot of which I've posted on the subreddit, but two days ago, I had another encounter. It's the first encounter I've had in over three months. I think of an encounter as when I come face to face with one of these things outside and not just seeing it in my car. Last weekend, I decided I would do a hiking trip where I was just going to hike a local trail, set up camp, and spend the night out there. The hike was beautiful. I completed my hike uneventfully. I set up camp at about 6 p.m. and got a fire started so I could cook dinner dinner. Went uneventful, and so did most of the rest of the evening. After dinner, I went back to my tent, and I just relaxed, read a book, and enjoyed nature. At some point, I must have fallen asleep because the next thing I know, I hear something outside. I instinctively know what it is because I have been taking a lot of time to actually research these creatures and figure out how to best live among them. If you ever encounter one, I stayed silent and didn't move from my tent until I thought the thing was gone. It wasn't gone. I climbed out of my tent to investigate and to pack up and go because I knew I wasn't sleeping that night. I didn't hear anything. The woods were still dead silent, so I knew it still was probably around, but I knew one thing. I needed to get out of there because even though I know a lot about these creatures, I still know that they are dangerous. Even though I knew it was dangerous to hike in the dark, I had a pretty powerful headlamp and plenty of batteries because I liked to prepare for anything, and I knew it wasn't a very long hike back to the car. About two hours at most, as I began my hike back to the car, I began to hear it following me, crashing through the brush just out of sight. So I picked up the pace and unhooked my gun from my bag in case I needed to fight. It continued to follow me for about ten minutes before it finally showed itself. This one was pretty average size for a dogman about eight and a half feet tall. I don't know if it was black or dark gray hard to tell at night. This one had orange eyes. We looked at each other for a few seconds, and then it went off back into the woods. The entire time I was hiking back to my car, I kept hearing it follow me on and then off. I'd hear it crash through the brush. I never did see it again, and I made it back to my car safely. This was one of my most unique encounters I've ever had, because it seemed like this one was not as aggressive as the others I've seen. It was just kind of making its presence. Not, I believe, I don't know if it had any ill intent at all. All. I know is it still scared the shit out of me. That's my most recent encounter.
It was a pleasant night in North England around 12.30 a.m. in August 2011, and I was walking to my then-girlfriend's. Being around 17, I was by now well accustomed to the streets that only a few years ago seemed quite alien. Like any other night in those days, I was out with friends. We would get high and find something fun to do. I was a little bit stoned writing this. I still am all these years later. But I had been smoking for at least two years by that point, and you just don't hallucinate on weed. You can get paranoid, sure but you do not visually see things like this. All these years later, I still don't see this as a hallucination. Rather, the weed may have allowed this to happen somehow. But I don't want to get into that side too much and just focus on the actual event as I'm writing. When it was time to go home, we would split off into groups and headed in our own directions. I was now walking to my girlfriend's alone after leaving my friend at the end of his road to picture imagine an empty but quiet main road heading out of a town into the villages. There are fields, trees, and also horses. But this wasn't a horse of the shape of any animal I knew. I'm walking on the left hand side of the road. It's dark and the only light is from the lampposts that are dotted every ten or so paces near the hedgerow on the right side. That realization hit me instantly when I saw this creature. The shape of it in the glow of the light, this long, huge, black, muscly, tall and lanky, but at the same time ripped thing. It was massive, seven or eight feet. Its tail was over a meter. It looked like nothing I had ever seen before or since. Arched over almost. The form of this thing. It looked like it could stand up bed poly if it wanted to. All of this I kind of processed in the blink of an eye. Actually, I did because I stood there staring at this beast. My eyes just locked in a way that was instinctual to see if it was aware of me or something. As I'm staring, my hand is reaching simultaneously into my pocket and grabbing my phone. I don't even look at my phone as it's in my hand. I just dial the first number on my call list. You know how when you press the green phone and see the list, I pressed the last number I called. This is all in the first few seconds when I realize what I think I'm seeing. This is all where the story weirdly gets a bit blurry. I called my friend and explained to him that I was seeing a goddamned werewolf. I remember doing that, but I don't remember hanging up. Really, or more importantly, walking past it or seeing it go off. My friend remembers me calling, but... He doesn't remember what we said at the end of the call. This was almost over ten years ago now. It quickly became a joke. But I think he and the people who I have talked to about it somewhat believe me now. There is a history of similar sightings in the United Kingdom, both old and new, and it wasn't until a few years later that I became aware of paranormal researchers in my area. They are releasing a documentary this year about the werewolf dogman phenomenon. I am not affiliated with them or anyone, but it sure does drive my story home when I find this out years later. Since then, I have been following the subjects and subjects alike. Please have questions because my memory is bad after some time and I have told the story so many times to myself that it has become strained. But I wanted to get this down. Thanks for reading. I work as a trucker, and during one of the flights, I witnessed an interesting case. My path ran through fields, forests, villages, and villages. At about two o'clock in the morning, I began to think that it was probably time to stop somewhere for the night and just sleep. I had enough time for delivery to move calmly and not be afraid of being late. Driving past one of the villages and entering the forest belt, which was located next to the village, I suddenly punched a wheel. I got out of the car and looked at the breakdown. The wheel was literally torn to shreds. There was nowhere to go. It had to be changed. There would be no problem if it was one of the rear wheels. But I punched the front ones and all the replacement work had to be done on the road. It was drizzling fine rain, but in principle it was warm outside. I took out a spare tire, a key and a jack. Suddenly there was a roar in the forest, and the birds from the upper branches of the trees scattered to the side. 
I was stunned because I was standing on the street and holding only a wrench in my hands. It was the only thing I could protect myself with. Then I heard a growl and the crunch of breaking branches. I was scared and immediately jumped into the car and moved to the passenger seat. I lowered the window a little and watched what would happen next. For a very long time, I saw absolutely nothing and only listened to something huge moving in the night thicket of the forest. Then someone roared again in the forest, and it wasn't a scream or a growl, but a roar. After that, the crunching stopped, and I sat motionless in the car for about ten minutes. Thinking it was over, I slowly opened the door, and then branches crunched next to my truck. Along the way, the one that roared in the forest and made noise with breaking branches also stood and watched me in my truck for ten minutes. I slammed the door again and decided for myself that I would sit until dawn. Suddenly, in the headlights, a creature with a dog's head appeared on the road, but moving on two legs. He ran across the road into the forest to the other side and disappeared into the darkness. I closed all the windows and decided to call rescue service. To be honest, I didn't know who to call, so I dialed the number one that came to mind. I was out of range of the network. I sat up all night without closing my eyes. In the afternoon, when there were more cars on the highway, I got out and changed the wheel. After downloading the tool, I hit the road and got to my destination without any problem. Nearly ten years ago now, my husband, a mutual friend of ours, and I went hiking in the BRM in North Carolina. It was intended to be a day hike, lead by our friends, so we brought only our day packs, enough water for five miles, and some of those tuna packs with crackers so we could snack. We get to the trail our friend had supposedly hiked before, and when it forked, he said he wasn't sure which one he had taken, but it circled a ruin, so either way, it would lead right back. Now is a good time to explain this friend. He is spacey in the way that we have to remind him to eat the food on the fork he has been holding for a few minutes, or in the way he sliced the tip of his finger off with a bandsaw because he was looking at his coffee. He and my husband had been on many backpacking and hiking trips before, but our friend had never been a leader before. This was the trip he wanted to prove his skills. About seven miles in, on top of a clearing, he admits he is lost. When we ask a few of the random people setting up camp along the trail where the trail back to the parking lot is, nobody knows. So with no more food, no more water, and dwindling light, we are lost. My husband is excellent at orienteering, so he now takes lead. I am center, and our friend is the caboose. My husband gets out his water filter filters water into our Nalgenes from a fast-moving river, and picks a direction to follow. About three miles into this new trek, it is now pitch black. We are in the thick of the forest. It is cold, and we hear a whimpering, whining sound. We stopped and listened for it, and as we do, my husband turns his headlamp back to look at me and freezes. His eyes grow large, and he tells us to keep moving, and if we see a good, sturdy, walking stick-sized branch, to grab it without stopping. Of course, our friends and I looked behind us. It was a pack of coyotes. We had wandered into their territory, and they were telling us to get out of it. We kept moving, and the coyotes kept following, constantly making these yippy whining sounds to let us know they were still there. It felt like a death walk, and the longest death walk at that. Finally, after what felt like dozens of miles, the trail widened and connected to another trail. But we followed my husband straight on the path we were on, as did the coyotes. The trail opened up to the parking lot where we quickly walked to our car and quickly jumped in. As we drove away, we saw the coyotes standing in the tree line watching us. Our friend has never lead another trick since then. This is a story that my grandfather had told me back from when he was younger. He's had property in his generation for a long time, and he and his father used to hunt on their property out in Texas. As of currently, our family had moved to Minnesota, 
And then, as where we've been currently residing for a long time, we actually don't even visit the old property anymore and haven't in ages. My grandfather has been hunting since he was just a boy, so he's a fairly experienced woodsman who doesn't really ever fear much. It still gives me chills to this day to hear this encounter because my grandfather still gets shaken up every time he recounts it. My grandfather hunted all sorts of game. Deer, coyotes, squirrels, you name it. They had a lot of property to work with, so he had a lot of time on his hands to really learn the woods around him and get a good feel for the game in the area. There's even wild turkey that would run around there from time to time, so there was plenty to hunt all season long. This particular day ended with him taking a route that he didn't normally take to venture out to a different part of the property that he wasn't used to. He and his father had several different routes they would take on their property to go venture off to different spots to go hunt. After making it maybe a mile is when he started to hear strange vocalizations and other bizarre noises in the woods around him. At first he told me he thought it was a bird, but he said there's no birds in the woods that sound like these noises did. They would come and go, so he kind of wrote them off at first, but they started getting louder and more frequent but he kept venturing further because my grandfather isn't afraid of anything. After venturing maybe another mile was when he started to get hit with a very strong skunk musk odor that was said to smell like rotting meat and skunk. My grandfather described it like coming upon a pile of a hundred dead rotting skunks just sitting in the sun and baking. He said it was so strong there'd be times it was hard not to want to gag and vomit. He said he kept looking around but didn't see anything, but he started to get the overwhelming feeling that he was being watched. At this point, he knew something was up. He couldn't find the source of the smell, and things were getting more eerie as time went on. He also told me that as he ventured around the area, there were times where he would run into stuff that didn't quite look right, like markers that weren't quite man, made as if they might have markings from animals or something. He told me about how he found smaller trees that were ripped up out of the ground and turned upside down and pulled back into the ground. What's scary was this is back in the 1940s and their property was pretty large as well as being private, so nobody was going to be hanging out on their property doing anything like this. And if so, Who's going to rip up all these small trees out of the ground, and who's going to have enough strength to drag them back into the ground? This was really unsettling. My grandfather also believes he stumbled upon a small den of whatever it was he was smelling. He said he also found a small cave opening that opened up into a cave that he estimated to be roughly 30 square feet, but the stench of the dead skunk smell was where it was coming from. He also said he could see bones just from the cave, and it's alone and decided it was probably a good idea to head back home. Although they were the bones of deer, from what he gathered, he didn't want to take any chances. He told me that as he was leaving the den, he started to get an extremely overwhelming feeling of dread and felt the need to get the hell out of there. That's when he noticed rocks starting to be thrown in his direction, and I'm not talking about little pebbles. I'm talking rocks the size of a tire, literally being thrown through the woods about 10 to 20 feet near him. This was obviously enough, so he was so scared he booked it out of there and got back home as fast as he could. He said whatever was throwing those rocks at him had to be incredibly strong, and obviously not a human. He said there were some sort of stomping and screaming noises that were going on as soon as he was leaving the den. Something was trying to drive him out of the area, and whatever it was, was close by. He tells me there were multiple of these things, not even 50 feet away, but he couldn't see them. After that, he still continued to hunt on his property, but not nearly as much as he used to, and he never went beyond where he went before. He continued to stay in new areas. His father never said much about it, and I guess there was never really a whole lot to discuss since back then. Especially, you'd be practically crazy if he ever brought it up. The property ended up getting passed down to him once his father died, and not long after that, he moved to Minnesota due to his career. I had been out fishing once in the Norwegian mountains. 
a small lake full of frying pan-sized trout, etc., and during the summer night, this far north, it can be easy to lose track of time. I realized around 22 that it was getting dark, and I start packing up and walking the two hours back to my car. This is in the western mountains of Norway. It's pretty steep, and it goes from bare mountain to birch brush, then grazing meadows, a swampy bog, and finally spruce forest. I usually let my mind wander as I walk. There's nothing to be on the lookout for. The most dangerous thing in Norway is the government, and they sure as hell keep to the capital. I'm enjoying the walk satisfied with a day of fishing. It's warm. A slight breeze has picked up, and it's keeping the insects from biting. I'm in no hurry. My peaceful bliss was shattered just around midnight, when a shriek pierces the calm bubble my head was in. I nearly pissed myself. It sounds like a freaking banshee, and my blood starts boiling. Hairs all over my body is rising. I start to sweat. I knew the sound was from a fox, but for the remaining 20 minutes of my hike, I couldn't shake it. I started thinking that it sounded like a man being beaten to death. All kinds of panicked thoughts raced through my head about demons, horror movie monster, corpses. I have heard foxes shriek before but this caught me by surprise. This took place back in the early 90s. My buddy would work until 9 to 10 p.m. On a Friday, get home, pack his fly fishing gear and essentials, and then rack for four or five hours. He would then drive an hour to my place, and we'd load all the camping gear into his truck and take off before first light. This particular trip took three hours to get to the Cinema Honing Creek in Potter County, Pennsylvania. We got there early, set up camp, grabbed a brew and sandwich, and finished until dark. We turned in early because of the long day. I woke and could see moonlight peek through the hemlock canopy as I tried to decide how badly I had to go to relieve myself. I decided to get up when I heard something very heavy approaching the tent. I thought, great, a freaking bear. It came within four or five feet of the tent, and I could see a partial shadow silhouette against the tent. Its breath was a deep, guttural grunt, and it just stood there for almost a minute. I almost crapped myself thinking it was going to attack the tent, so I quietly unzipped the sleeping bag while trying to will the boogeyman away, as if by magic it left heavy footfalls trailing off into the night. I decided I didn't have to go after all and started to drift off to sleep when I realized it walked away on two legs. I instantly knew what it was and lay awake processing everything. I finally fell back to sleep after convincing myself it wouldn't return. In the morning I was careful not to mention anything to my buddy as I inspected the campsite for footprint. Nothing, zip nada. The hard-packed earth and surrounding stones prevented any footprints. The weird thing is I kind of blocked out this event for years before acknowledging it to my buddy after he saw a Bigfoot in Lycoming County. Why I buried that event in my memory beats the hell out of me for fear of ridicule. I don't know, but I can't help but wonder how many other folks have done the same. My mom grew up in Ontario, California. Back then, most of Ontario was eucalyptus and orange groves. She was spending the night with a friend one night as they were watching the sky and the eucalyptus trees. When an entire family of squatches, she said there was what looked like a large male, a female, and an adolescent. This would have been back around 1953 or so. I've only found one other story from the area, I believe. It was at what used to be Ontario Motor Speedway, and everyone had seen it on the other side of the track where it was overgrown. It was in the papers, I think. I'd have to dig deeper. I was fighting a wildfire with a Native American hotshot crew in 2001, would be impolite to say which crew it was. Anyway, this happened in northern Montana on the Canadian border. Twenty minutes helicopter ride from nearest road. 
They asked to be removed from duty because they saw Bigfoot's nest, according to them. We went later the next day to see what spooked them, and it was a weird lean to and a really deep, heavily covered draw the fire had jumped. Nobody asked any questions or made fun. They weren't joking around, and to their belief system, as I understand, it was a big deal. The spot deaf had a strange vibe. Something big had bed down there and weaved branches into a large five. Ten-foot diameter rough nest. So I ride to work on my bike very early in the morning, about 3.30. Bicycle, to be clear. The last few nights, something very unsettling has been happening. As soon as there are no cars in view of me, front or back, all of the wildlife, I crickets, frogs, etc. Just stop making any noise altogether, and I will get a seriously bad feeling like something is watching me, hair standing on the back of my neck and chills down my spine kind of thing. In addition, I have heard what I can only describe as a horse galloping with fleshy hands instead of hooves. Last night I thought I saw some kind of silhouette next to a tree, and then two bright silver, yellow eyes peered back at me at what seemed to be somewhere between six, seven feet high. I nearly shit myself and just pedaled as fast as I could trying not to think about it. But I know I saw something, and I know what I'm hearing isn't just paranoia. Am I crazy? Does something not exist that matches this description? I'm not one to believe in the paranormal or serptids or anything really, but ever since I've moved to Utah a few weeks back, I've been seeing and hearing some shit I just can't explain, and it's got me weirded the F out, this most of all. I was born in 1976 in Dayton, Ohio, and shared a room with my brother for several years. This event took place when I was in my bog bed, so I must have been at least five, six years old. My brother had one side of the room, and I had the other. We had a very large walk in closet, and the door to it was at the foot of my bed. One night, as I was trying to get to sleep, my brother was already asleep. The door opened, and I know this sounds crazy, but out came Big Bird. I remember being frightened at first, but others came out too, and they were very friendly and led me into the closet with them. All I remember at this point is that Big Bird gave me a flavored chapstick, most likely to ease my fear because I love chapstick. And they brought me back to my bed. I went to sleep very happy over the whole experience and was not afraid anymore. I put the chapstick under my pillow after taking a tiny nibble, leaving my teeth marks just to see if it was still there in the morning. The next morning I checked, and lo and behold, the chapstick was there, just like I remembered, and at that moment I knew for a fact it was not a dream. If it were not for that chapstick, the experience probably would not have stayed with me all these years. I tried to tell my brother, but he laughed it off. If anyone would, it sounds totally crazy. Now, after reading the other accounts of similar experiences, I am wondering if it was an abduction disguised as a friendly interaction. Another really weird phenomenon happened to me in the same house, but in a different room within the ten years I lived in that house. I have somewhat of a timeline as we moved when I was ten. I will describe my other experience, which could have been an abduction, in another email. Thanks for taking the time to read this. I would love to read more about these Sesame Street types of events. This happened in 1980, two years ago. I had a girlfriend who had been killed in a car accident by a drunk driver. She had gotten in the accident on August 18th, and on August 20th, she had been pronounced dead two months before her 20th birthday. On Halloween night, there was a party at the house where she had lived. Her roommates had decided to have a party to try and get over the grieving process and whatnot. We had hired a band from over in Everett, Washington and I was over at the house to let the band in. The band that came, none of them knew about Lisa's death, and the head singer for the band had gone into the bathroom back by Lisa's bedroom. It was a female with dark hair. 
Lisa had red hair. She was in the bathroom combing her hair, and she let out a scream like I had never heard before in my life. I went running back there, and she was standing there in the mirror just as white as could be. And she looked at me, and she said, Someone has died here. And I said, What do you mean? And she said I looked into the mirror, and it wasn't my face. She described Lisa right to a T. She walked out of the bathroom, and she turned and looked right at Lisa's room, and she said, That's her room. Well, the first thing I thought was that these people were trying to play a really sick joke. I got together with a couple other people, and we were talking about it. And this girl from the band kept wanting to leave. And before she had gone into the bathroom, she had been so excited about playing this gig. Later in the evening, I was standing in Lisa's bedroom talking to somebody, and I looked out the window and I saw her reflection from behind me and heard her voice asking me to leave. I left the party, and later that night, over $10,000 damage was done to that house by people getting out of hand. Sitting here recalling it, I get the shakes like I did that night. I really believe that she had come back, not wanting people sitting there getting drunk and wrecking the house. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.